So welcome to the Young Anglican Theology Project. It's good to have you joining wherever you are today. My name is Gregory Stark. I am one of the core team members and part of the editing team. And today I am joined uh, sort of serendipitously in person by one of our authors for this cycle, Emily Clough, um, who happens to have been connected to the college here in Cambridge where I am now the assistant chaplain and was um, visiting. So we, we decided to do this interview in person and record it and share it with you all. Um, Emily, I would uh, just invite you to introduce yourself and share a little bit about who you are. And I just wanna thank you for uh, writing this piece and inviting us to consider the theology of icons and their role in our life of prayer. So if you'll just say a few words about who you are, where you come from, and maybe briefly just the context for uh, writing this piece. I'm Emily. I'm from the north of England, um, Yorkshire, and I trained as a maths teacher before realising that I wanted to, well, before I started the discernment process to become a Church of England priest. So I'm now working at a church in London whilst discerning vocation. And whilst I was trying to process all of that, really got into the idea of art and theology together. And so I wrote this piece. Thank you. So you and I were talking about um, the process of writing an icon. And one of the uh, elements that you said is that um, first you start with the halo and then you finished with the tear ducts. And in your piece, you write about the experience of this connecting you with the humanity um, and the experience, uh, the, the humanity of Christ. And so I'm wondering what this process of icon writing says to our theology of Christ's divinity and Christ's humanity, Christ's holiness and Christ's connection with all of us. I think what was really interesting about that idea was the fact that it was both separate and together. So when writing an icon, you make the halo first. So you make this halo and that's very, very much a divine thing to do. And then you're painting a face and that feels very human. But then those things sort of start coming together and you see how the face and the halo are kind of one and the same. And then as when you're making an icon of Christ, you put some red on the halo to divide it up to make sure that it is an icon of Christ and couldn't be confused for a different saint. It connects all of it. So you're you're drawing a line that connects from Jesus's ear to the edge of this halo. And you're physically connecting the human to the divine. And I've always thought it's such a complicated idea that someone could be fully God and fully man, because it is a very complicated idea. Um, I, I, as I used to study maths, there's this, there's this really famous quote, um, the essence of mathematics is not to make simple things complicated, but complicated things simple. And the same is very true with theology. Um, some, we're not trying to overcomplicate very simple things by using fancy language. We're trying to make some of the most complicated things very understandable. Mm. Mm. Thank you for that. So on this topic of complication, uh, you write near the end of the piece, you quote the passage from Matthew about not worrying about the troubles of tomorrow, but letting today's problems and troubles be enough for today. And I wonder if you might speak to both your experience of writing this icon in the context of a retreat and also just how the process of writing and gazing at an icon 
speaks to a theology that can respond to the world's busyness, anxieties, frustrations, whether on a personal level or on a broader level. So when I was writing this icon, I had just moved to London, which is an incredibly busy place where I kind of constantly felt like I needed to be doing something. And so the very concept of please go on a retreat and calm down and be with God seemed just completely implausible. And I thought I have to do something. And the the closest way I could find to doing something was to create this piece of very Christian art. And in that, I found the place to slow down, to think, to have the space. And then I realised just how valuable that space was, that I wouldn't be wasting time if I were sat contemplating things for 15 minutes, that that isn't, that isn't useless time. That's in fact incredibly useful time. And I think it, it meant that I could worry about things within the present moment. When, when you've got to wait for something to dry, you are worried about that one problem as opposed to, but tomorrow I'll have to mix this new batch of paint to paint this new colour. You, you can't think that far ahead. You, you, have, you have no ability to actually worry about the future in a way that in modern life, you seem to constantly because you're constantly reminded that tomorrow is coming and it will have new problems. Thank you. To shift gears on the topic of tomorrow, <laughs> to go against this maybe, but no, to, to speak within that, that context still, I'm wondering what your hopes are for the next generation of Anglican theologians. Where do you hope Anglican theology will go? I really hope that the next generation of Anglican theologians feel a freedom to explore things and to push boundaries and to not feel confined by what has always been said and always been done, but that that comes from a place of understanding the past and tradition and that people don't feel like you have to have written things in a certain way or have studied in a certain way or be a certain type of person to explore any issue in theology. Well, thank you for modeling that in, <laughs> in what you've shared with us, both in your writing and in this conversation. Um, I hope that everyone watching receives this as an invitation to engage with icons and icon writing, whether you, however you might engage with that. Um, and to go and be those new, the next generation of Anglican theologians. So thank you for joining us. And thank you, Emily, again, for this piece. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.